BioBalance HealthCast, episode 235, Troubleshooting Testosterone Replacement Issues. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we're going to talk about the 10 most common troubleshooting concerns that Dr. Maupin's office deals with when they do bioidentical pellet replacement for hormones. And what makes her practice unique, and we've written about it in our book and we talk about it in a lot of our podcasts, is that she's created an environment where she can take the time to study the labs, to talk to the individuals, to get a complete medical history, to problem solve and troubleshoot side effects or issues that might reduce the the maximal or optimal uh, desired effect from having bioidentical hormone replacement. So what we want to do today is go through and why this is important. It's important to the women who are getting the treatment, but it's also important because one of the things that Kathy's trying to do is to train other doctors to do what she does the way that she does it. So that this is more of a standard of care uh, for people who receive hormone replacement pellets. And so what she teaches that no one else in those mass uh, consumption institutional mm-hmm. systems uh, does is troubleshooting. So we're going to talk about the 10 most common problems that she troubleshoots, what they are, what she does about it, how she recognizes them, uh, what the results are, and so on, so that at the end of the day, women receive optimal outcomes. All right, and, and this is specifically about troubleshooting testosterone pellets for women. Okay. Not we're not going to go into troubleshooting estrogen. Well, we've done that in other, other, in other podcasts, podcasts pretty recently. So, so, uh, so this is about troubleshooting testosterone when somebody has had testosterone pellets and comes back for a follow up or calls us and says, "But I'm not. My symptoms of blank are not resolved, mm-hmm. or I'm not." getting the progress that I thought I would get in whatever the symptoms are and then how do we how do we troubleshoot that and bring them the outcome that they desire okay so one <clears throat> of these and, and they're not necessarily in a prioritized <laughs> list no they're not they're just one of these is weight gain women come in and say well you told me that if I got this done I would be able to lose weight uh, I said lose size and, and I always that's remind the them that you always make yes. because testosterone makes us gain muscle Mm -hmm. and gain bone density. So that increases our gravity. So it may increase weight on that, on that front, but it helps us become leaner. It gives us, if we, if we do the things we're supposed to do, which I always go over, like exercising at least three times a week for an hour, but hopefully more than that and eating a low carb diet, but plenty of protein to make those muscles. Right. And uh, optimally sleeping six to eight hours a night because that's very important. And we make you able to sleep by giving you testosterone. Um, and decreasing stress. So this is what I tell everyone that they should be doing on their end. I'll do my part. They have to do that part. Mm-hmm. So testosterone itself um, isn't going to just make you lose weight if you continue to eat a high-carb uh, diet and don't exercise. No one's going to ever lose weight with anything if you continue to do that. But for those patients that come to me, usually they've been on an exercise program, they've been eating properly or at least semi-properly, and they're looking to lose body fat. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, measure your waistline, don't measure the scale, because in the first six months you're going to be trading, you're going to be making muscle losing fat so you'll get leaner the which muscle is, is denser and heavier than fat right so fat fat is a larger volume for a pound of fat it's like that big and then a pound you know what a pound of steak looks like that's muscle and so that's much smaller so at first testosterone makes you smaller especially in the most important waistline areas because that's how we look for high risk high risk heart disease is right. is your waistline big so it starts bringing this down if we've got everything balanced properly then it then starts making enough muscle to burn calories while you're sleeping. So, so, so even the, when you're not 
Even when you're not working out, you're burning calories. So in some ways, it's like that old joke about which is heavier, a pound of feathers or a pound of steel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about heavier. It's, it's smaller. about density and size, bulk. Mm -hmm. and, and we look at size. Women look at size. Men look right. at weight at, at their belt size. Right. You know, so it's easy to measure it. But I, I usually provide a tape measure if you don't have one. And then you can follow your waistline every month. And if if that's not going down in four months, when we do the second right. the second um, dose, then we have to look at some other things. If you're doing your part, I'm I'm providing the pellets. Then we have to look at other things. We look at we look at lab. And in the lab, if you're making, for some reason, genetically, uh, usually genetically, you're making a lot of estrone still, even after pellets, well, that keeps you, your waistline enlarged. It right. keeps belly fat there. So we have to somehow block that. We can block it with DIM, which is diendol methane, which is a supplement. And we try that first, usually. And then Arimidex is a drug that we can use that stops the production of estrone and shrinks belly fat. Okay. So that's those are the medical interventions. Another intervention would be if you have, if I recheck your lab and you have a high cortisol. Cortisol gives you tons of belly fat, back fat, neck fat. I mean, just swells, that kind of swells you up. Thing. Yeah, you get you get um, back fat right over the cer the end of the cervical vertebrae right, right here, and and then you get kind of a moon face. But long term, high cortisol will do that. Well, if you've taken steroids, or for some reason like Medrol Dose Pack, or um, if you've taken Medrol in any form, uh, any kind of steroid that they would give you for a bee sting or autoimmune disorders, that actually is going to make you gain fat even if you're on pellets. What about so, stress levels? And stress levels, if if I look at your lab and your 8 a.m. cortisol is, is elevated, right. then that is going to cause you to not lose belly fat. Okay. So we combat, combat that with something called endodrin. It's a very low dose adrenal supplement that you take every morning that, that decreases the stimulation to your adrenal glands. So that helps you lose belly fat as well. Okay. So those those are two interventions that we provide, but sometimes we find that our patients are insulin resistant. I was just going to say, we, we did a podcast uh, a couple weeks ago about overweight, insulin resistant women. Mm -hmm. And then you were making the point in that podcast that a lot of people are not overweight, but still are insulin resistant. Right. And, and they have normal blood sugars. Of, yeah. So nobody really sees it. You have to check the insulin level. If the insulin level is over seven when you're fasting, then that's considered insulin resistant in, in the age management medical group um, uh, normals. Mm -hmm. So that's when we start intervening with a six meal a day, low carb diet, um, high protein diet, we do that, and then we also use either metformin or Victoza, which is a medication that is usually given. Both are given for diabetes, but both shut down uh, insulin resistance and decrease belly fat. So we don't give the, all of this to everyone. We give whatever they seem to have as their which is, which is the whole point of troubleshooting. Right. I mean, you, you don't just mass produce what you do, and, and it's one-size-fits-all panacea. Right. You spend the time to find out where is this problem coming from. And then fix and that problem. intervention for that problem. Not just throw everything at it. So, okay. so, not, so weight is, is a concern mm -hmm. uh, for some people, and you problem-solve and troubleshoot mm -hmm. the weight issue. Another one is libido. Yes. So... Uh, they say, if you replace testosterone, you I got my testosterone and my libido is not back. Mm -hmm. And so many people come to me with multiple psych drugs. Yes. Okay, so that means anti anxiety, antidepressant, um, anti schizophrenia, mood um, balancing. Blockers, mood, yeah. yeah, mood balancing drugs and beta blockers. So for those people, I usually say, you may not feel the libido unless we change some of these drugs after you feel better. I mean, you'll feel better depression-wise or mood-wise, but you may be able to go to your other doctor and get the, the doses decreased, and then you may feel more of the libido, but you're not going to feel the same libido that most of my patients do you, feel. Do you find that those other doctors are willing to be collaborative with you? The psychiatrists the are. The psychiatrists that, I've, that I have been working with 
have been really helpful and they get it right. because they understand neurotransmitters, they understand testosterone's right. effect on it, and they understand estrogen's effect on it, and they they that's their thing is neurotransmitters. They understand that. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're they're very helpful. Plus I don't mess with their drugs. Right. I mean, so. if I went in and said, Oh, well, we're just gonna wean you off of all these drugs they would not be happy. Well, so I send them back to their doctor for, for sake, that. If you are on psychotropic medicines, don't ever play with the dosage without no. discussing it with the doctor that prescribes it. Right. You have to go back to that doctor yeah. and say, oh, I'm feeling better because I'm taking pellets, so now can I go down on some of these drugs because I'm not getting all the benefits. Right. So that's, that's the first most common reason that my patients don't feel better. Mm -hmm. One of the other reasons which is very, is, is just as not obvious as this is obvious is uh, an elevated ferritin level and I started doing ferritin levels on women because I had been doing them on men ferritin, ferritin means is like iron in the blood yeah okay a lot of iron in your tissues that means you're storing iron in your tissues not in your blood and not passing it out yeah so you're you're storing it like a heavy metal in your brain and your eyes and and your liver and it can cause liver damage so right. but before it does that it makes you feel really tired really tired, really fatigued, and it's really hard to feel any of the other benefits of testosterone like libido if you're so fatigued. So I've been testing men for this because testosterone increases the absorption of iron, so I don't want to cause any any negative problems for my male patients, and they usually have a higher ferritin because they haven't had a lifetime of bleeding like women have. So women don't get the obvious signs of high ferritin until they're older and it is a genetic thing it's usually in the northern european great britain common commonwealth uh, of the british empire basically yeah. and northern france so in st louis there's a lot of everybody of that genetic line so i started treating <coughs> or checking the women when somebody came in one of my patients came in she looked great everything was great except after a dose of testosterone, she just felt terrible. And so I ran that on her just, I don't know why I ran that popped on into her. Your head. It popped into my head and I thought, well, I wonder if that's the problem. She didn't really, she was Northern European, but you know, she hadn't really told me uh, anything about having high blood counts or anything in the past. So I checked her and it was Okay. five to six times normal right. and after she she gave blood I sent her to a doctor who would look into this and help her get rid of uh, the iron she gave blood she came back to me she said now I feel it all great I feel it I feel better I've got the libido back I have the energy back I feel like myself again which is really what I'm looking for I just want people to feel like they used to so sometimes when you replace testosterone people their bodies are getting the response that you want them to get, but their awareness of that is being blocked by some other infection or illness or problem. Right. That or other hormone. And we haven't talked about estrogen, but if we have somebody who for some reason has too high an estrogen level on their own or mm -hmm. they were they make or or the pellets are are absorbing too quickly and they have a high estrogen level, that binds up their testosterone. Yeah. High es estrogen takes away the effects of testosterone. So then we have to deal with that by putting them on DIM or Arimidex to stop the high estrogen or we and we drop their dose yeah so that's another reason why people don't feel well the um, a low thyroid that's another hormone that makes you feel tired so people inter kind of confuse they still feel tired so they feel like the testosterone's not working mm -hmm. well if their thyroid's not um, replaced properly or not working properly and we see that a lot in the Midwest because we don't have any iron in our um, in our environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me. We don't have any iodine in our environment. We find that um, that oftentimes we have people with low thyroid that aren't obvious. We test for that, treat it. Right. And if and if it's in the normal range, then usually they feel their pellets feel like they should. But so, if they aren't, if their doctor says don't take that, yeah. Then their pellets, they're like, I don't know what happened, but I don't feel good anymore. Exactly. Because they stopped taking their thyroid. So, it's not testosterone. So we talked about three of the more common problems. Mm -hmm. like people come back and just categorically say, I, I don't feel the benefit that you told me I would feel or that mm -hmm. I was feeling. Uh, people that have weight issues and people that have loss of libido issues. But also, I forgot to, we forgot to say, if you smoke dope all the time, you're not going to feel your libido. And if you and drink alcohol. too much alcohol, too you're much not going to feel your libido. It changes other hormones that block the testosterone in the brain. So 
Those well, are things you can control well, we yourself. We also didn't talk about the fact that it may not be physiological at all. Yes. It may be psychological. Mm-hmm. For instance, you may have a low libido because you have issues with your partner and you don't want to have sex with them. Right. And and because there's a level of power or control or intimacy that's involved with that. Or what you want isn't what they else. give and what yeah. they want isn't what you give. And so that's not going to be solved with a hormone. A lot of times that libido gets redirected and relabeled and it's called anger. <laughs> uh, so you're feeling it, but you're calling it something else. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that is true. And it's something that you have to really think about. Usually we go over that in the beginning, yeah. getting your libido back. Are you getting along with your partner? I mean, is is well, everything okay? And then you make okay. referrals to counselors, yeah. psychologists, or yeah. what have you, because that's a complementary treatment to what you're doing physiologically. Right. I, I mean, you need to have the hormone for the sex drive, but you also need to have the relationship. Yeah. Have somebody you want to have sex with. Right. So, yeah. or the the <laughs> should have the right person you want to have so, sex so with. So, a fourth common side effect that people come in and say, you know, since I've had my pellets replaced, I'm having this constant ringing in my ear that I didn't have before. Mm-hmm. What do you do about that? Well, sometimes they come in with ringing in their ears, and sometimes they get it afterwards. But oftentimes, that has to do with the ferritin level again. So we're back to ferritin. To the iron, iron deposits, and it increases the ringing in the ears. So we have them give blood. So are you finding that as a standard now, you're measuring ferritin levels? Yeah, I'm, st- I'm doing it on everybody in the beginning. I wasn't trained with that, but I do. Yeah. I do that. All right. What about if their blood count is too high? Is that also part of the whole ferritin thing? Um, you can have a blood count that's too high. Even if your ferritin's normal, so you can take all the iron that you absorb and, and put it into your blood cells. It's not as dangerous as if you're making ferrit or you're making iron and putting it into your into tissues. your tissues. But if you're making uh, too many red blood cells, mm-hmm. then what they do is they sludge. So if you have a high hematocrit, high hemoglobin, then they slow down as they go through the small blood vessels and capillaries, which can cause either clotting or deposition of of, um, hemosiderin. And so that causes like lots of little red globule or le- red stuff in the skin if it's in the superficial. Like a rash? It looks like a rash, but it's really... It's really like iron that's been deposited through a broken blood vessel. It can huh. break and just deposit the iron. So yeah. you don't want your blood blood vessels to sludge. It's not good for you. It can cause stroke what, and What you see plotting. with alcoholics when their face and nose are all swollen and red all the time? No. No, that's something. That's, that's a little different. That's that's usually a sign of some kind of liver dis- malfunction and clotting problem. Okay. And fragility of their capillaries because... I love that you know this. They're stuff. killing off all, all of their nutrients yeah. because they're drinking too much. Right, right. So uh, their nutrients, I mean, I know they the keep you but I didn't intact. Know that's what causes that. Yeah. Okay. So, well, well, let's flip it. One okay. of the, the, we've talked about five of those things. Mm-hmm. So the sixth one is the reverse of the third one, which is I have too much libido. Right. Now, all of a sudden, as a matter of fact, we had a, a patient in common who really complained about that. She went from not enough, not enough, not enough to like I'm eyeballing you know, the clerk at the grocery store, the mail. But that was just in the very beginning. Usually it's a temporary issue. It's usually at the most a month. Uh-huh. That occurs right after you've gotten the pellets for the first time. For the first time, so it's a surge. But not, it, it's it's an. Um, <laughs> it's like wahoo. It's a sensitivity yeah. to the hormone that you have been deprived of. So your body is oversensitive to it. It picks all of it up, and then it gives you too high um, a response. So yeah, it, it's a limited deal. Yet, mm-hmm. um, many people <laughs> don't want to have a sex drive at all. And that's where I have a problem because later you still have your own sex drive that you would have had when you were in your 30s, right. but but they don't want to have one. They don't have a partner. They don't know what to do with the sex drive. They don't want to make bad decisions. I understand all that. That's, that's a dose thing. So we can decrease the dose. Okay. Where I come into a problem with that is we decrease the dose and then their other symptoms come back. So it's hard to find that perfect level right. that keeps them from having a sex drive, but also gives them uh, all the relief of their symptoms that they need, like sleep and and energy. Okay, so problems seven and eight mm-hmm. are mirror images of each other. Mm-hmm. One is I have swelling and itching after I get my pellets mm-hmm. at the site of the of the insertion. Mm-hmm. The other is I sometimes expel my pellets. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about both of those at the same time? Yes. Um, the 
when you have the swelling and the itching, mm -hmm. generally that means that you're allergic to something in the powder that the pellet was made out of. Now, the pellet's made out of soy and yams, but there, some of the pharmacies put a binder in them. Mm -hmm. Some don't put the binder in. Some use a specific um, method that causes them to... Uh, have a little difference in the uh, in the powder itself so it causes irritation it's an allergy mm -hmm. so we treat it once they're in we treat it like an allergy we use uh, Zyrtec or we use uh, Benadryl at night mm -hmm. uh, ice um, Benadryl creams you know we, we try to just decrease the reaction from the anything reaction. short of steroids and then we change pharmacies or we change the type of pellet. Some people are allergic to Arimidex, and we have combined pellets that that have um, testosterone plus Arimidex in it. Mm -hmm. And so when we put those in, sometimes that one pellet is causing the reaction. So the next time we give them just the straight testosterone and give them oral Arimidex so that they don't have to have that reaction so they can tolerate the pellets. Otherwise, they're not going to tolerate them right. if they have to go through this each time. Some people have a slight reaction every time they take Zyrtec for a couple weeks or three weeks or four weeks. And then expelling is, expelling is more of a foreign body reaction or an allergy reaction. Some people, you know, you, you have a reaction in your body, believe it or not, that if you have a splinter, right. your body works to push it out right. because it's not part of you. So some people have this res an over response yeah. and anything that's under the skin, they try to push out. Yeah, they any reject. Form of, and soldiers who were wounded in the war, a bullet or shrapnel or something, mm -hmm. report 20 years later, you know, that they were wounded here and it works itself out over here and comes out their side. Right, well, which is kind of dangerous. Uh, yeah. Shrapnel. Right, but <laughs> this is this is just a little the point is your body tries to push things out that aren't natural to it. Right. So oftentimes, not often, but infrequently, we have people that do this. Right. And and there are some things that they do that can that could cause that to happen like exercise too soon we tell them not to exercise for 72 hours after the pellets right. they go out and exercise that night that that moves the pellet around it doesn't get settled right. and it doesn't start healing around it so so that's that's a compliance problem yeah. but th we also have uh, patients who pick at it <laughs> that's not a good idea and but but other but other than that there there are real there are real physiologic reactions that some people have that aren't going to tolerate the pellets i mean mm -hmm. i mean every once in a while i'll find somebody that won't keep any of them in they'll spit them all out wow. now it's infrequent on the thousands of people we take care of you know this is not a very frequent problem that i have to deal with mm -hmm. but um it, it is a problem, and it is something that we change pharmacies for or we change medications for. Some people, we give antibiotics in case we think it's it's an uh, infection. Right. One of, our, one of our patients that I remember, we, you know, you can't get into a lake or, a, or any kind of body of water. You can take a shower after the pellets, but right. for three days, you can't get in the water. Right. So they went to the nasty, nasty lake of the Ozarks where and E. coli yeah. is, I mean, E. coli is what's in poop. It's in the lake. And it got into their their pellet insertion. Yeah. I mean, we had to give them antibiotics, and then the pellet worked itself out because of that. Speaking of antibiotics, there's another reason, another problem mm -hmm. uh, that causes you to give people antibiotics sometimes mm -hmm. uh, in advance, of uh, pre and post. Yes. And that is if they have like a pacemaker or a, a hip replacement. You deal another with another foreign body. <laughs> another foreign. Some body. Some kind of foreign body. Sometimes it depends. Their doctors will tell them whether they need antibiotics or not. Okay. Some kind of. Um, Heart valves need antibiotics before they have dental work or any other uh, injections. So, we that those are part of the questions that we ask. Yes. So uh, we will give people antibiotics just like they were going to the dentist yeah. before we give them the pellets and after. And then the last one of the ten is one that we've done several independent podcasts on, and that is that uh, people who suffer hair growth. Uh, that they don't want to have. Right. Too much hair growth on their body, too little hair growth on their head. Yes. So many times it's misinterpreted, first of all. Mm -hmm. So people come in and say, oh, I've been on pellets for five years and all of a sudden my hair is falling out. Well, now we know, we've learned that oftentimes they've had anesthesia since the la in the last six months. Anesthesia itself, for any reason, makes your hair fall out. So you go into a shedding phase huh. for six months. And at the end of six months, it all starts 
getting normal. So we always ask that because not there's I, nothing I, did not know I can do about that. Yeah. There's I mean I just have to Well, but you don't wait realize till it. I know when it's gonna going happen, to whether stop. You're taking pills or not. Right. This isn't so the pellets though. I don't yeah. have to do the, all these other things right. that have to do with testosterone's effects on our body. So if you so we have to look at the th other things that cause hair loss. Mm -hmm. Low thyroid. I have a lot of people that all of a sudden their hair will fall out, but their doctor took them off their thyroid. Their other doctor. Right. Or <laughs> and, their insurance company wrote and said, we don't do this yeah. for elderly people. <laughs> yeah, well, that wouldn't that wouldn't have stopped us. Yeah. But you do but for some reason or thyroid has just stopped working. Yeah. And so then we do some blood tests to see. Steroids. Corticosteroids makes your hair fall out all over your head. Now right. testosterone makes your hair fall out right here. And right here. Mm -hmm. So if your hair's shedding all over, it's either thyroid anesthesia, low thyroid anesthesia, or high cortisol. That's that's so, it. So it's so we have to look at what drugs you're taking and go through all of this. It's kind of a, a, a reason. I mean, it's a workup basically. Well, and most dermatologists go, oh, taking testosterone, that's the problem. They don't well, even look well, at it. And that it. brings us full circle again because again, most of the physicians who do these treatments do not work through side effects the way that you work through them. They don't troubleshoot it. They don't know how to troubleshoot it. They don't spend time on it. They just quickly sort of dismiss it. Well, if person. I had those problems, I want somebody to work on it, right? Absolutely. So I try to treat my patients like I would want to be treated. And you do. And that's why you also are offering to train other physicians who might be interested in getting the training that you offer mm -hmm. for how to troubleshoot with these things. That's right. I am. Because I think that this these are not things that you should just walk into the doctor's office and they go, oh yeah, we do pellets here, take some. And then you have problems and they have no idea what to do for you. But we've investigated research, figured out good troubleshooting plans so that our patients won't have to be left hanging when they're taking the hormones that make them feel great and solve a whole lot of so symptoms and they have to give that up because of something that isn't fixed. So we right. want to fix it. Okay. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.